We are in seal number five. We've done the first four seals in the four horses. We've summarized it. We brought it together. We've related it to our time. We've done a parallel to the parable of the sower in Matthew. And now we're in the fifth seal. And it's going to be a continuation. It's not like we're leaving the others behind. They're connected because history connects. We've seen how the gigantic Roman church system of religion has become a masterpiece of Satan's power, a moment of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Uh, Note The Great Controversy, page 50. In this study, we will continue to see what depths the Church of Rome will stoop to. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge? and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. One of the things that we see in the beginning of this picture in verse 9 is the altar. We know that the altar either represents the altar in the outer courtyard of the sanctuary system or the altar that was in the holy place of the sanctuary system. This one is not the one in the holy place because it's not called the golden altar. The golden altar was the one that was in the holy place. Also consider this. The blood of the sacrificial victims were poured out at the foot of the altar on which they were offered. See Leviticus 4 verse 7. Christ was offered in sacrifice on the altar of Calvary. He was slain without the gate in the court of the heavenly sanctuary which is in this earth. And for three days he remained in the tomb under the altar, where his blood constituted a cry for vengeance upon his enemies. Likewise, the millions of martyrs of the Middle Ages were slain on the altar of sacrifice and martyrdom. And John sees them at the foot of the altar, or under the altar, in their graves, where their blood, where their shed blood, constitutes a continual cry for vengeance upon their persecutors. Taylor Bunch, The Revelation, page 44. For further confirmation, turn to Hebrews 13, verses 10 to 12, which which tells us that we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle, whereof Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Hebrews 13, verses 10 and 12. These are martyrs. That's the context of this. These are people that gave their life because they refused to give up their faith in Christ. They held the cross. They held to Calvary. They held to the blood, right? They didn't go with the pale horse. They didn't go with the black horse. They didn't compromise. They weren't cast out. They held to the blood of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. The Lamb that is opening the seals. They held They held the white horse rider all the way. Now, before we look 
at some more supporting texts from Exodus 29, let's consider our position in the camp of Israel. As you know, the fourth seal left us on the north side of the encampment. But now that we're on the fifth seal, we're taken back to the altar of burnt sacrifice on the east side of the sanctuary, which corresponds to the work of the white horse rider. Though we also realize where the white horse rider is currently, the fifth church time period, located in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, we need to note that he is about to transition to the most holy place. But before he does, he must remind us of his foundational work in the outer court at the altar of burnt sacrifice. At the same time, he is acknowledging those who, with intensity of desire by faith, taking hold of the rider, they subjected themselves to his rule, even to death. Their one desire was to be like Christ, always keeping the standard of righteousness uplifted. To them is given an eternal weight of glory, because on earth, symbolized by the outer court, they walked with God keeping themselves unspotted from the world, revealing to their fellow beings in this dark world the righteousness of Christ. Now let's get back to Exodus 29 and look at some other supporting text. And thou shalt take the, of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy fingers and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. Exodus 29, verse 12. It's interesting that the Bible points out in Revelation 6, 9 that they were slain for the word of the Lord, or for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. If we put those two together, word of God and testimony, it reminds us of the commandments of God in Revelation 14, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ or the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 14, 12. Notice that the saints in verses 9 to 10 are asking God to judge, which indicates they themselves have not judged, nor have they placed themselves in the seat of judgment over those who hated them because of the gospel they preached, lived, and died for. Why? Matthew 7, 1 tells us that we should not judge lest we be judged based upon our own judgment. If we judge, we place ourselves in Satan's shoes, who is called the accuser of the brethren. Note this verse. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accused them before our God day and night, has been hurled down, Revelation 12.10. Satan is relentless in his accusations. He accuses God's children continually. He hates God and all that God is, which means he also hates God's mercy and forgiveness, which he extends to sinful humanity. Satan, the accuser, stands before God in an attempt to somehow lessen God's love or diminish God's mercy. Fortunately, his accusations against us fall on deaf ears. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Romans 8.33 Salvation belongs to the Lord and his justification cannot be reversed. God is greater than our accuser. Don't forget where the seals are unfolding. They're unfolding at the table of showbread. Therefore, the mention here of the word of God, or the bread of life, within this context, reaffirms to us that these are the things that are surrounding the table of showbread. 
it emphasizes the word of God in this battle of Satan to attempt to capture the mountain, the congregation, God's people, and to separate them from the word of God. Yet here we have a group of people who are saying, you might as well then take my life because I'm not going to give up the word of God, the blood of Christ, or the testimony of Jesus. With the fifth seal, if we want to know how can we check what we're seeing based upon the timeline, we would go back to the fifth church, which is the church of Sardis. This is the church of the Reformation. And we understand that under the Sardis church, people were being persecuted because of the word of God. What we're looking at here primarily is the period of time that points us to the Protestant Reformation and those who are being persecuted through this Reformation. But there is something else that's important to understand here. Let's take a look at Genesis 4.10. Regarding Abel, the Bible says, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. The context of this is Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, and they are told to worship God. They're continuing to give offerings for God, and Abel goes along with what he's being told, and he sacrifices a lamb. Cain, on the other hand, decides to bring the fruits of his hands, of his labor. And basically, Abel tells him, that's not going to work. Cain says, don't worry about me. And then, as they offer their offerings, Cain's offering of works is rejected, whereas Abel's offering by faith is accepted. As a result, Cain gets upset at his brother, and even though Abel's remonstrating with him and loves him, Cain ends up getting so angry with his brother that he kills his brother. Persecution. There is a person that's relying on the works of their own hands rather than on the offering of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So the person who's relying on his own works is killing the person that's relying on Jesus, that has faith in Jesus. Do you see the connection here? to our timeline, Cain was a worshiper too. So it's not like he's saying, I don't want anything to do with God. He brought a sacrifice. So he was a worshiper of God, similar to what we saw with this pale horse who was supposedly worshiping in the name of God. We're doing this in the name of God, yet it's against the will of God. One of the points that we're looking That is the fact that the blood of those crying out under the altar, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, does not only represent those who were persecuted during the Protestant Reformation, who symbolically are crying out, How long, O Lord? This is taking us all the way back to the very beginning, to the very first martyr, which is Abel. That means the fifth seal, in in a sense, starts all the way from the beginning of time. The lamb slain from the foundations of the world, but then brings us down through time, placing an emphasis on the Protestant Reformation. Note what David says in Psalms. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble, Psalms 9, verse 12. It doesn't start with the end of time. It reminds us of something that has been postponed from Abel's time, from the beginning, put off and put off. In fact, it even comes out in the churches where it says, I gave her space to repent, Revelation 2, 21. A lot of space. Notice what the spirit of prophecy tells us. And as the blood of Abel cried from the ground, there are voices also crying to God from martyrs' graves, from the sepulchres of the sea, from mountain caverns, from convent vaults, 
How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Taken from Ellen White's book, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, 5 page 451. What we find in the Protestant Reformation is Martin Luther, Jerome, Huss, and Wycliffe all are part of the same church. They didn't want to start another church. They are remonstrating with their brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church. That's what Abel did with Cain. He's remonstrating. Hey, you know, you need a lamb. The lamb, the gospel. These people from Abel's time on, these people in church history, they are the people under the altar. Their blood is crying out. What God is doing is he's connecting this story, this fifth seal, to the story of Cain and Abel. It fits perfectly. Abel remonstrating and remonstrating. Cain's compromising and persecuting. Abel's trusting in Jesus and the blood of the Lamb, but Cain's trusting in the works of his own hands. Then notice what happens. Even in the story, after Cain slays Abel, God comes to Cain and remonstrates with him, and then gives him time, gives him a space of time. He doesn't kill him right off, but make, but marks him, gives him time. And so that's the same thing that's happening right here. There's a time frame that's given. Even when the reformers started preaching, God gave more time before the deadly wound that's inflicted in 1798 the end of the fifth church, the end of the Dark Ages. And there's time being given here for more of the Word of God to take effect. Time for the light of the gospel to get through the thick darkness. Time for the people to understand what's being preached by the faithful few. And more time for those who are going to be slain because of the testimony of Jesus. More time for people to draw close. Yet there is an important judgment that has to come, and white robes needed to be meted out. The martyrs are asking, how long before you judge? This tells us something very important. During the fifth seal, or at some point within the fifth seal, they're asking for judgment. But judgment is not yet being given, or has not yet started. They're saying, how long, how long, how long, or how long dost thou not judge? So there comes a transition where judgment has not begun yet, and we see that in the next verse. And the white robes were given figuratively or metaphorically, unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. And just remember that time period, a little season. It says, while robes were given unto them. Now white robes are a reward. They signified purification, right? The righteousness of Christ, the cleansing. The question is, why weren't white robes given to them before? Abel was righteous. Think about how these people died in the name of Christ. So why weren't white robes given to them at the time of their deaths? Why is it that after a certain amount of time passes, white robes are given to them? The answer is profound. So let's go over to the book of Zechariah. Very quickly, Zechariah 3, 1 to 4. And to find Zechariah, go to Matthew, then back two books. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. 
Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Zechariah 3, 1-4. According to what was just read, we have Satan accused, accusing one of God's own. Notwithstanding the defects of the people of God, Christ does not turn away from the objects of his care. He has the power to change the arraignment. This tells us that the change of raiment would be connected with the iniquity passing from them. Where did their sins go? It's transferred to the Lamb of God. Continuing the quote, He removes the filthy garments he places upon the repenting, believing ones, his own robes of righteousness, and writes pardon against their names on the records of heaven. He confesses them as his before the heavenly universe. Satan, their adversary, is shown to be an accuser and deceiver. God will do justice for his own elect. Ellen White, First Object Lessons, page 169, paragraph 3. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. You can find reference to that in, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357 to 358. Now we take this concept back to Revelation, where we have dead people under the altar, symbolically speaking, but we know this is symbolism because the dead can't speak. We've discussed the state of the dead in previous lessons. The saints are asking, how long? What God is showing us is that the judgment process begins with the dead, at which time they are sealed and given white robes forevermore. That points us forward in time to what we call the investigative judgment. What's really powerful about this is that judgment does not take place when Jesus returns, but prior to it. Even though judgment begins prior to the second coming, they have to wait for the conclusion, rest yet for a little season, before receiving the ultimate reward or rewards, crowns, new bodies, etc. This confirms it's an investigative judgment, because if it was the final judgment or conclusion when Jesus is coming, then crowns would have been given to every one of them as they are brought back to life. Instead, it says, but you must rest a little bit longer until your brethren that will be martyred like you will be fulfilled. In a way, there's two time periods, a time period from the fifth seal to the sixth seal, and a space of time from the beginning of the investigative judgment until those final brethren go through a trying experience, and Jesus returns. Remember, the dead are judged first before the living. This is to signify to us that a judgment begins for the dead when the investigative judgment commences, after the fifth seal, at the conclusion of the sixth seal. One could conclude that this is what they're likely told to wait for, uh, the beginning of the judgment of the dead, since they are dead and they're asking, when will the judgment begin? But let us not forget the promise given in the fifth church. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelation 3, 4. Again, this is a promise of what's to come, of the second coming. It's promised to the dead, but not just any dead. It's promised to those who were martyred 
for their faith were secured to Christ and accounted of him as conquerors. They had fought the good fight. They were to receive the crown of glory when Christ should come. Uh, Note Great Controversy, page 42. Keep in mind that while we are still living, we're still going through the process of sanctification. But once we die, there is no longer time to choose a different path. So those who die on the right path are secure. They are sealed at their death. Christ will take away the fifth the filthy garments from them. He will cause thine iniquity to pass from thee and will clothe thee with change of raiment. Like Zechariah says, they set a fair mitre upon their heads and clothed them with garments. Zechariah 3, 4, and 5. Even so, God will clothe you with the garments of salvation and cover them with the robes of righteousness. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Though ye have lion among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and your feathers with yellow gold. Psalms 68, verse 13. This is an encouragement to those who faced martyrdom and death with the assurance that despite the seeming triumph of the enemy, vindication would ultimately come. Such an encouragement would be particularly heartening for those living in the time of the terrible persecutions of the Dark Ages or of the Reformation and after. For those living in the Dark Ages, it must have seemed that the long period of oppression would never end. If we understand that the investigative judgment began with the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844, we can understand that in addition to the beginning of judgment, the everlasting gospel had already begun to go forward. Let's look at Revelation 14 without going into all the details right now. I want to simply show you the connection between Revelation 14 and the fifth seal. In Revelation 14, verse 6, we have the everlasting gospel, or the beginning of the first angel's message, which would correlate with these white robes given in Revelation 6, 11, and uh, Revelation 3, 4, that's the fifth seal and the fifth church. Then we have the hour of his judgment has come, Revelation 14, 7. That's the last part of the first angel's message. That's the judgment message. And the rest of the message of the three angels began to be proclaimed more loudly in 1840 to 1844. This is not after the, the little season, Revelation 6, 11. This is starting the little season from 1840 to 1844. With this message being given, with the judgment being opened, and with the judgment books being opened, and then you have a little season coming after that. Remember, they're waiting for the judgment to commence, and that doesn't happen until 1844. But we could also say there would come another time for persecution and martyrdom just before the return of Christ. So again, it seems they're waiting for the commencement of the judgment in 1844 and also the second coming. In Revelation 14, 12, we find the final part of the third, of the third angel's message where it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Remember what the saints are being persecuted for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, right? Now, the three angels' messages go together. They go simultaneously. At the end of the three angels' messages, in verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and the works do follow them. Revelation 14, 13. Before the time period, 
before this time period, the dead are symbolically crying out, Lord, when are you going to judge? Rest. They're sealed and given white robes. And then you find here that when the judgment message begins, there's a blessing to those who die now because they're not crying out, Lord, how long? No, judgment is going on now. So their blood no longer is crying out. Instead, blessed are those who die. The ending of the fifth seal is pointing us to the judgment that is to come, in which all the redeemed who were dead are sealed and receive white robes. What's happening is, in Revelation's fifth seal, we have this intimation, white robes, the crying out, and rest for a little season. In Revelation 14, it expands upon that with the everlasting gospel. The hour of his judgment is come. No more waiting. It didn't actually say that in the fifth seal, but now it's saying the hour of judgment is come, and blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. They will be sealed and receive white robes. Blessed are those that die in the Lord. So that connection is right there. The two are right there. Going back to chapter 6 in the fifth seal, we're talking about the Reformation era, and what we're doing now at the end of the fifth seal is we're moving from Sardis into Philadelphia. And what happened during the Reformation era? The reformers came and they recovered what? The Word of God, the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe. And what did he do? He translated the Bible into the English language. So they recovered the Word of God, and then white robes are talked about in Revelation 6.11. Both white robes and the altar would point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was the main focus of the Reformation? To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we move on through history, these reformers lived, they contributed, they died, but the Reformation didn't stop with them. It went right into this movement called the Millerite Movement, which was primarily from 1840 to 1844. That movement brings us to the time of judgment, the actual time of judgment. In that movement, we move into the next seal, which is going to help confirm the time frame of all this by giving us some other confirming signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Millerite movement would therefore correspond with the Sixth Church, Philadelphia, but we're not yet there. We're still in the Fifth Church. We're still in Sardis, and we're still correlating the symbols here. They're taking place under the fifth seal with Sardis and with the future message of the judgment to come. In this case, the white robes is the gospel, the garments of salvation, and the robes of righteousness, Isaiah 61, verse 10, the righteousness of Jesus that we're clothed with. They're one and the same, right? The gospel is the righteousness of Christ the good news of Christ, our righteousness, right? That's the gospel. So we're taking some liberty here to expand these phrases and see their worth, to really spread them out and then connect them with all these different areas in the book of Revelation and in the Old Testament, just to show the fullness of what this symbol is, because here's what's happening. John is being given the book of Revelation, which is a distillation of the entire Bible. Only God could do that. God takes all the books of the Bible, not including Revelation, and he juices them down into Revelation. You take a little glass of that stuff and you're empowered for the whole day. Every word has meaning. Every word has to be uncapped. And what's in there? Wow. 
we want to unseal this. How do we do it? We go to the rest of the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament. We go to the rest of the Word of God. You look up these phrases, make the connections, and let it simply be absorbed into your mind. So this is what we're doing here. We're making connections to the Old Testament. We're making connections to the New Testament, to the seven churches, and making connections forward to areas where we haven't gone yet. We haven't gone to the seven vials yet. But when we get there, we're going to see judgment. We're going to see the connections we've laid here. God is just going to repeat and enlarge, repeat and enlarge to give us a fuller picture. Perhaps a little recap would be good just to make sure that it kind of gets sealed in here. Again, what we're looking at with the fifth seal is how it's going to correspond with the fifth church. It's going to point us to the time period of the Protestant Reformation. Is going to bring us into the understanding that there was a judgment being asked for. We see there's little time or season of time, a prejudgment. Then the judgment begins at the end of the next seal. We're going to see that the judgment begins with the dead. It begins with the souls under the altar. Their blood is crying out for judgment. Here's a really interesting point for us. In Revelation 6.10, it says that the martyrs cried out with a loud voice. And in Genesis 4.10, the scripture states, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That's the clarification we need to have. Both person and blood spoken of are synonymous because we understand that when we're dead, we're dead. You're no longer speaking or conscious. Genesis 4.10 is helping us to understand what it means when it says in Revelation 6.10, they're crying out. They're dead. They're lifeless. But their blood is crying out. Not only does Genesis 4 tell us that, but it also has these amazing correlations with the sequence of history. Cain trusted in his works, and that's what the church has come to do. Abel trusted in the blood of the lamb, and that's what we have with the white horse. Then we have those who did not trust in the blood, those who are pale. They're completely gospelless. When Abel realized that Cain's sacrifice isn't accepted by God, he implores his brother. He gets angry with him and kills him. So we have persecution, a persecuting, compromising, bloodless church. Then we have Abel representing the white horse. And so the whole point is when that voice says, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? That takes us all the way back to Cain and Abel, to the beginning. That makes sense because the judgment is inclusive of everyone all the way back to the beginning, even of Abel. That's going to be crucial to understand when we get into Revelation chapter 7. But what's also interesting is that Cain receives a mark because of his rebellion. As we, again, move forward in the book of Revelation, we're going to see that those who rebel, as Cain did, are going to be marked. There's going to be a death decree. And those who actually partake in that death decree, those who take the wrong side during that death decree will be marked. They will be marked for the same reason that Cain was marked. It was a sign of his rebellion against God. Of course, the Bible says God marked Cain to protect him as well. 
consider that if a wicked person like Cain was taken to heaven, they would be miserable. So they must be marked to distinguish them. The primary reason he received that mark was because of his rebellion. It was because of an evil action that he did. We have that amazing parallel there. Again, we see the fifth seal. Revelation 6, 9 points us to the altar on the east side of the sanctuary. It points us to the white horse rider who suffered and died for our sins, but who now lives as the lion of the tribe of Judah to be with us as we move forward, westward, towards the final prize of glorification, of kingship, or crowns allotted to us, who will sit with him on his throne of heavenly mansions, etc. But we're reminded in our westward journey that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. Why? Because as we are sent forth traveling westward, we will be as sheep in the midst of wolves. Matthew 10.16. We're instructed to not look back like Lot's wife, but to keep our eyes on the prize and move forward. This fifth seal is a prejudgment seal, and it ties in to the first seal because the church is getting a reset of sorts. Also, it's letting us know that there was a time, a time of no judgment, where things kept getting darker and darker, yet even now we see the white robes are given unto those who are crying out for justice. It was a glimmer of hope in things to come. Those who've died in Jesus have been just and true. Their sins are promised to be blotted out, which is what the cleansing of the sanctuary yet to come is all about. Next, a double confirmation of this. Rest for a little season. So this cleansing isn't happening right now. They still have to rest a little while. There's still going to be some persecution coming up. So there's still waiting. There's still time for other martyrs to come along that will, faith, will be faithful to God, that are holding to the white horse and its rider. During the Dark Ages, Rome added hundreds of thousands to the vast throng whose blood she had already become guilty with. But the spirit of persecution would be finally restrained. The cause of the martyrs was vindicated, and the little season of the fifth seal came to a close. But it could also be suggested that there would come another time of persecution and martyrdom just before the return of Christ, and that's the little season. But to me, the time from 1517 to 2020s is not a little season, but a long season. Therefore, I personally believe the little season of the fifth seal came to a close by the end of the sixth seal, when the judgment of the dead commenced. It's equally true that there will be more martyrdom prior to the end, during the seventh church time period. Notice the following quote. The two armies will stand distinct and separate, and this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convicted of the truth will come on the side of God's commandment-keeping people when this grand work is to take place in the battle. Prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned. Many will flee for their lives from the cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. You will not be tempted above what you, will, what you are able to bear. 
Jesus bore all this and far more. From third volume, Selected Messages, page 397, paragraph 4. Let's wrap this up with one last quote from the Pit of Inspiration. From Garrett's, from hovels, from dungeons, from scaffolds, from mountains and deserts, from the caves of the earth and the caverns of the sea, Christ will gather his children to himself. On earth they have been destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Millions have gone down to the grave loaded with infamy because they refuse to yield to the deceptive claims of Satan. By human tribunals, the children of God have been adjudged the vilest of crimes, but the day is near when God is judged himself. Psalms 50 verse 6. Then the decisions of the earth shall be reversed. The rebuke of his people shall he take away. Isaiah 25 verse 8. White robes will be given to every one of them. Revelation 6 11. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Isaiah 62 verse 12. Whatever crosses they have been called to bear, whatever losses they have sustained, whatever persecution they have suffered, even to the loss of temporary life, the children of God are amply recompensed. Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, page 179 to 180.